Well, today was the last day for evidence and testimony in the Karen Reed trial, day number 30. Tomorrow, we're going to closing arguments, and then the only questions that remain are how long is it going to take for the jury to reach a verdict, and what is that verdict going to be? Is it going to be guilty? Is it going to be an acquittal? Or is it going to be a hung jury? So that is what we have to look forward to tomorrow and possibly the next few days as the jury deliberates. So let's jump into the testimony and the evidence that came in today. So we had Dr. Frank Sheraton. Dr. Frank Sheraton is a forensic pathologist, a chief medical examiner who uh, was the chief medical examiner in a county in California, a real, real expert. Performed between 12 and 13,000 autopsies, was qualified f over 400 times as an expert witness in courts. So this is the real deal medical examiner expert. And what does he testify? He testified that the injuries to John O'Keefe's arm were inconsistent with him being hit by a car going 24 miles per hour. And he also testified that the injuries to his arm, to his arm, uh, occurred sometime before death, which was also consistent so far with the other medical uh, testimony in this case as well. He also testified that there was no bruising by those lacerations, which you would expect, those abrasions on his arm. You would expect bruising if he was hit by a car, uh, perhaps some fractures as well. And he testified that most likely those injuries, those lacerations, those abrasions to his, John O'Keefe's arm were from dog claws or dog teeth. He also testified that the absence of the, any injuries to the lower extremities, as we keep hearing about, is also significant, uh, showing that this was not a pedestrian collision with a car. And he also said that it was consistent, actually, with a physical altercation. As we know, there's some bruises to the back of his hand, John O'Keefe's back of his hand, which could, could be defensive wounds, and the laceration over his eye also is consistent with a physical altercation. Something else that he testified, which I thought was interesting, was the fact that after he sustained a skull fracture, after John O'Keefe sustained a skull fracture, he said that he would have lost consciousness very, very soon after that skull fracture. And if he would have lost consciousness, obviously he cannot go anywhere himself, crawl anywhere himself, roll anywhere himself. Um, the only other possible explanation is that if the force of a vehicle would have propelled him 20, 30 f uh, feet away, which we're going to hear about the biomechanical engineers in a minute, or if somebody actually moved him. So, uh, but not consistent with him himself being able to drag himself or roll himself over to the middle of the, uh, the, the lawn. Now, on cross-examination, Lally did make some decent points. Number one, he got him to concede that the cause of death would be blunt force impact along with hypothermia. He also testified that the injuries to his arm did not cause him the death. So even if he was bitten by a dog, but that did not cause him the death. Um, also, the fact that he was not provided with the DNA results, which showed that there was no canine DNA on John O'Keefe's shirt. He also was not shown pictures of the other attacks that Chloe, the dog, uh, attacked other humans and what the bite marks looked in for those people. Also, he was not aware of the taillight fragments, which were found to be in John O'Keefe's clothing. He also did not know about the DNA of John O'Keefe on the taillight housing, which was detected there. He also didn't know about the hair that was found on the tail, which came back as having DNA from John O'Keefe. He actually even testified that he asked specifically about certain DNA results, and he was told that actually there was no DNA from John O'Keefe. So that was interesting there. Um, he also doesn't remember the DNA from John O'Keefe on the drinking glass. So that was also uh, another part. Now, he also did say, though, pretty clearly, that he does not believe it's possible that the injuries are from the taillight. So even though, despite all this other information that he didn't know about, he still does not believe that it's possible that the injuries came from the taillight. Now, he also testified that the laceration to John O'Keefe's eye was not from something like a glass. It was not from something sharp. It was more from blunt force uh, impact. So that was uh, the testimony of Dr. Frank Sheraton. Then we got to the biomechanical engineers. We had Dr. Daniel Wolf, the director of accident reconstruction for ARCA. And we've heard about him already earlier from the voir dire on day 27, but we didn't hear so much about the substance of what his testimony is going to be. So we heard about his background, how extremely qualified he is, and he's done over a thousand reconstructions before, several hundred which would include pedestrian collisions. So 
he certainly uh, is very qualified. Now, somebody asked uh, on one of the live sessions that, do I think that the judge is going to allow Jackson to say that they, these biomechanical engineers were hired by the FBI and the DOJ? And my answer to that was, I find it very hard to believe that she would allow that in. I don't think she's going to allow it in, and that's exactly what happened. She did not allow that in. That's why Jackson was not allowed to ask for it. But however, I did say that Jackson is probably going to be allowed to say that he himself did not hire a Dr. Wolf to just show that there's no bias between the defense and Daniel Wolf. And that, again, I was right about. He was allowed to say that part, too. He said that about both experts, that the defense did not hire you in this case. And that's, by the way, very important because one of the very strong points of cross-examination that you a lot of times do when you have an expert for the other side is you show that the expert was hired, how much he's getting paid by the other side, how often the other side uses that expert. And, you know, so those are always takes things, takes credibility away. But here, Jackson's pointing out, we didn't even hire you. We're not paying you. A different body, even a different agency hired you. So this is completely independent. Now, there were some times he tried to get in a question that, so you're saying that you're uh, your conclusions and opinions are 100% independent, and on that, the there was an objection, and the objection was sustained. So he was not really a lot of allowed to get in that fact that they're completely independent. However, they really are because they weren't hired by any side to do this reconstruction. Now, something that Daniel Wolf testified to was the fact that the pictures of the evidence actually was not properly done, and this is again another problem with the investigation of the police here. And he testified that. Sometimes you, you look at the pictures here, and, you, and they're all close-up pictures of different, air, different pieces of taillight. And what should have been done is that, you, yeah, certainly you can take some close-up pictures, but also take far-away pictures showing where all the pieces are in relation to each other. And he said that was not done, and that, was, that should have been done. He also testified that the glass on the bumper could not have come from the taillight. The taillight's plastic. Um, and then he got down to what his actual reconstruction was. Now, remember, his... He was tasked with reconstructing the damage to the vehicle. Not so much the damage to John O'Keefe, but the damage to the vehicle. How did this damage occur to this vehicle? And the way that he tested this was the idea, of that, the idea being that maybe the glass, the drinking glass, caused this taillight to shatter and break the way that it did. So he tested this theory by, by creating some sort of cannon to launch a drinking glass at a taillight and to see what type of damage it does. And the only possibility that he got by testing it at different speeds was that if you throw this, this drinking glass at 37 miles per hour, then it was consistent with the damage that was done to the taillight in this case. So the only way to recreate or reconstruct the damage that was done to the taillight in this case would be if that, that there was a force of 37 miles per hour being exerted from this glass onto the taillight. So obviously there was nothing here going 37 miles per hour, and that would completely debunk the idea that the way that this, the way that the taillight was shattered was by the uh, coming into contact with the drinking glass. And that's exactly what he testified. Now he also testified about the fact of whether there were, whether it's possible that the vehicle made contact with John O'Keefe's head. And he said that if you te when he tested that, when the vehicle was going only 15 miles per hour, and again, remember, according to the Commonwealth, it was going 24.2 miles per hour upon impact, but his test revealed that at 15 miles per hour, the damage to the vehicle was much more extensive than the damage to the vehicle which occurred in this case. And that was only at 15 miles per hour. So it's not possible that the vehicle smashed into John O'Keefe's head. He also testified that if the arm was positioned in the way that the Commonwealth suggested, and that's how the, ve that's how the, the uh, vehicle came into contact with John O'Keefe's arm, he said there would have been much more damage to uh, certain areas of the taillight or taillight area, which was not present in this case. He also testified that even if his arm would have been struck in the way that the Commonwealth suggested that it was, it would not have projected his body to go 20, 30 feet and roll or whatever. Wouldn't, his body would have not projected that distance. So really very, very strong testimony for the defense's side. Now, I thought, and I, I spoke to you about it in earlier videos, I thought that a good approach by Alan Jackson would have been to ask 
Daniel Wolf, and as well as the next witness, the same elementary questions that he asked Trooper Paul. And then it's very easy to show the jury, look, I asked these same basic questions to Trooper Paul, who was not able to answer them, because he just took a few weeks of courses by giving to the Massachusetts State Police about Reconstruction, and these people are actual real experts, and these people were able to answer the questions easily, and Trooper Paul couldn't figure out how to answer these questions. So I thought that would have been a good approach by Jackson. Certainly, these experts would have been able to answer his questions that he asked of Trooper Paul, and he didn't follow my advice. So what can I do? You know, I can only suggest <laughs> good tactics. All right. Now, on cross-examination, he, uh, Lally, pointed out that, remember, there was the shoe. Remember that shoe that was located on the curb with the suggestion that the Commonwealth's witnesses made, that that's very consistent with a pedestrian strike. Right? When a pedestrian gets hit by a car, a lot of times they lose their shoes or other, uh, other um, particles of clothing. And he brought that point out with Daniel Wolf. Now, to give Lally some credit, I have to explain to you, it is very, very difficult to cross these guys. I know I've been in those shoes. It's very difficult to cross these biomechanical engineers. And these guys are the top of their game of the biomechanical engineers. Okay, There are some biomechanical engineers that are not that great, and they're not great, uh, they're, they're not great witnesses. These guys are not like that. Okay, It's going to be very difficult. And I do not envy Lally at all for having to conduct any sort of cross-examination on these guys because you're bound to lose. You're not going to win the battle with these guys. So... Um, but he, he, he had to try, so he did try showing that, hey, look, the shoe was there, and the shoe was consistent with the pedestrian impact, and his response was, well, you're right that in certain accidents with a uh, pedestrian collision with a car, the shoe comes out, but the shoe comes off, but in this situation, the way that it's suggested that he was hit by his arm, he said the shoe wouldn't have come off. So that completely debunks the Commonwealth's argument there. Um, he also brought out the fact that he didn't ask to look at the vehicle, so he thought he was going to get somewhere here. However, his response was, you're right, I didn't need to. It wasn't necessary for me to look at the vehicle to conduct my reconstruction. So he struck out there as well. Also, he, he made a point that, well, it was very cold outside, and how are you able to replicate that? And he said, well, we did replicate it because we, we uh, made sure that the, the taillight that we were testing was 28 degrees. And he said, well, you didn't put that in your report, and he didn't. So Lally thought he got him because he did not put this in his report, which is a good point. However, he said, yeah, because the report's just a summary. We can't write every single little thing that we do in that report. But yes, I'm telling you right now, we did, in fact, make sure that that taillight was 28 degrees. So um, even though we didn't put it in the report. Also, he asked them, what about the blizzard, that there was a blizzard with wind gusts up to 37 miles per hour at the time? And he said, well, we were aware of that and it really, you know, didn't really make so much of a difference to uh, his analysis. All right. Um, he also pointed out that you didn't get the exact same glass, that same drinking glass that John O'Keefe was drinking out of. So how do we know if maybe you got a different type of drinking glass and that's therefore all of your calculations are off? So that was uh, a point that Lally made. He also asked him if he did a visibility analysis regarding the respect of the lighting. And he essentially responded that, you're right, I didn't do that. It wasn't within the scope, but it doesn't really make a difference because that really has nothing to do with this case, how much somebody can see outside because, you know, if this is what happened, then this is what happened whether it was light or dark. Um, he also pointed out that uh, you didn't know that Karen Reed said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. And you also didn't know that there was DNA that was located on the taillight that were associated with John O'Keefe. And you didn't also know about the hair that was associated with John O'Keefe on the bumper, right? You didn't know that either. So, you know, with that, he, he didn't ask him, the next question, which Alan Jackson is going to, but he's saying all this information you didn't know about, and you still came to your conclusions without knowing all of the information. Now, there was one decent part that decent point that he brought out was the fact that if, let's say, you have a car backing out, going one to five miles per hour, which comes into contact with another car, and remember, we remember that ring camera video where Karen Reed is backing out of John O'Keefe's house at five five o'clock in the morning when she's frantic to find him, and she does make some contact with John O'Keefe's car, and he was asked, Daniel Wolf, by Lally, would that be enough of force to create this type of damage to the taillight, which his answer was no. So that really was the strongest point, probably, of his cross-examination, that the defense's theory here, that that's when the, the taillight broke, was is not a good theory either. So now, again, of course, the defense can argue back that, well, that's when it cracked a little bit, and then the police took care of the rest. But still, 
uh, that was a decent point that Lally made on cross-examination. So Jackson really just got up, and as I was watching this, I was texting somebody, and I was saying, you know what Jackson has to do right now? And that's exactly what Jackson did. So Jackson got up there and said, if you were to know all these variables, if you were to know that uh, the DNA of John O'Keefe was located on the taillight and the hair was located that, would that change any of your opinions at all? And of course, his answer was, no, that wouldn't change any of my opinions. My conclusions and opinions are based on science, math, physics, and that's not going to change by the fact that you've found some DNA there. So that really took a lot of this, uh, the wind out of the, out of the cross-examination uh, for, for Daniel Wolf. All right, then we moved on to Dr. Andrew Retschler. And I will tell you that if there is anything, any doubt, uh, after Daniel Wolf, Dr. Andrew Wenschler completely sealed the deal. And he also, again, testified that he was not hired by the defense, and he testified that any collision, which is, again, also just understand, right, Daniel Wolf was there to testify about the damage to the vehicle. Dr. Andrew Wenschler was there to, to talk about the damage to John O'Keefe's body as a result of this alleged accident or a collision with the vehicle. So he said that any, uh, any speed above 15 miles per hour, you would expect to see fractures and ligaments in that arm. If, it, if that's what really happened, then anything above 15 miles per hour, you would expect to see fractures and torn ligaments. And here, it wasn't just 15 or 16 or 17 or 18. The Commonwealth's suggested uh, theory here is that it was going 24.2. Um, also, he testified that the injury to his head or his arm is not consistent with being struck by the car. First of all, how would you stand that way with your head just leaning into the street just enough to get hit? Also, if your head got hit by the car, then uh, there would be spinal and neck uh, injuries that you would see, and that you didn't see either. Also, he said that the taillight would be much more broken if it was hit, if the if the car hit into his head or to his arm. So, and there was no significant bru bruising by his arm. So, this is something that we're consistently hearing from the doctors, from the experts, that there's no bruising, no uh, no uh, fractures or, or um, injuries to the lower extremities, and this all. This all really debunks the whole idea that he was hit, that John O'Keefe was hit by the car. Now, there was one part, I think, of this video where Lally got up on cross-examination. He was really trying hard to poke some holes. Again, he went through some of the fact that he didn't know about the DNA, he didn't know about this, he didn't know about that, and the other thing. Again, it's not going to affect any of his decisions because his decisions are all based on reconstruction, which includes math, physics, and the human body, which... You know, what can I say? Whether there's DNA on that car has nothing to do with whether the force can cause these type of injuries. But there was one clip, I thought, which Lally was really trying to get somewhere, and Dr. Wenschler just completely, completely shut the door and really basically said, we have no idea how he got these injuries. They're inconsistent with the car, and we just there's just not enough evidence to say how these injuries came. Take a look at this clip. No, I no, I did not do it. No, because yeah, there, there's no need in this case. We don't know what happened in this case. There's no indication of. Certainly, it's not consistent with getting hit by the car and ending up where he did. Even if the ground is somehow hard enough to cause that type of an injury, again, there's there's no movement and no force to get his body over there, and the damage with the car is inconsistent with him get, being struck by it. So whether the ground could cause it or not. The roadway could cause it, the curb could cause it, a back could cause it. There's numerous different possibilities, and we don't really have enough evidence in this case to determine what one specific event actually caused that injury. You didn't have enough evidence based on what you were provided. Isn't that fair to say? I didn't have enough evidence based on what I was provided, and even looking at the additional evidence that I became aware of after the fact, there's still no evidence. I mean, you, you can't deny the science and the physics as to what would have happened if he was struck by the vehicle. So anything past that, you have to somehow overcome that hurdle, which, which is very difficult to do. All right. Well, at that point, the defense rested. So the question now that the jury is going to have to deal with, of course, they're going to have to hear closing arguments first, but the question is, is there reasonable doubt that Karen Reed committed this murder? Now, remember, whether you buy into the conspiracy or not, whether you think Jennifer McCabe conducted that search or didn't conduct that search, or whether uh, these searches were deleted and which expert, uh, which, which digital experts you want to believe or digital forensics experts you want to believe, believe you know, all this stuff, whether somebody saw that, whether they saw the, the John O'Keefe's body as they were leaving, all those people that were leaving at two o'clock in the morning, whether all that stuff aside, whether you believe that stuff or not, we can put that aside. The question, ultimate question that the jury is going to have to decide is, was Karen Reed in that car and did she 
gunned at 24.2 miles per hour and hit John O'Keefe with the intention to murder him. And after these two experts testified, and the medical examiners testified, these experts, that it is inconsistent. His injuries are, John O'Keefe's injuries are inconsistent with this car hitting, with hitting John O'Keefe. So then I don't really see such a strong argument how that's not reasonable doubt. Now, maybe you want to believe the prosecution's witnesses. Maybe you're more inclined to believe them, and maybe you feel that they're more credible. But again, the burden here is beyond a reasonable doubt. If these expert witnesses, who are extremely qualified, have all testified that the injuries of John O'Keefe are inconsistent with a car hitting him at 24 miles per hour, well, then that, I think, is reasonable doubt. And therefore, that's really what the jury has to decide. I can certainly see the jury coming back quickly with an acquittal in this case. Um, maybe there is a juror that will be a, 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 um, or a hanging on for a guilty verdict, but I would imagine that seeing what I've seen in this case, and again, I don't say any opinions until I see all of the evidence in this case, and now that I've seen all the evidence in this case, I can tell you that I would find it hard to believe that a jury is going to come back and convict Karen Reed when you have all these experts which say that the injuries to John O'Keefe were inconsistent with a motor vehicle a collision with a pedestrian. It's just hard to imagine, and that's probably what I imagine the verdict is going to be, either an acquittal or a hung jury. But you never know what a jury is going to do. Absolutely have no idea. Juries have surprised me in the past, uh, certainly have surprised with all different types of verdicts, so you never actually absolutely know for sure, but that would be my take on it. All right, well, that's it for now. We will see you next time.